So blessed to have uh, Pastor Jeff Bankwis to come and deliver the word of God. Uh, for those of you who doesn't know Pastor Jeff, um, he's been my pastor, my mentor, my friend, but way all the way back when we were in Hong Kong together, years. <laughs> and when I when we migrate here in Canada, we, uh, he's my pastor in Vancouver. And after a while, he doesn't like me anymore in Vancouver. <laughs> and that's why, that's why this mind is not working. <laughs> Love that man. sent me off here to Edmonton to plant the church and by the grace of God we are here today because of the work of God. Amen? Amen. Thank you Lord. Did you give the Lord a praise for that? Amen. So Pastor Jeff will come and deliver the word of the Lord to us. Let's welcome Pastor Jeff. Joseph. Mm -hmm. 
you know, this story, you know, from, from our youngest age in the Sunday school, we have heard of the story of Joseph and how the Lord has used him and how the Lord has delivered him. This afternoon, I want to go through it again with you and uh, because the, the, the scope of the story stretches from Genesis 37 to Genesis 50, the scope is so big. So what we'd like to do today is to have an overview of the story. But having said that, we need to start somewhere, I think. Don't you agree? Let's open our Bible to Genesis 37. All right, Genesis 37. And we have, I have uh, uh, chosen to just entitle this as worship hashtag life. Worship hashtag life. You know, uh, this, this device now uh, in the social media that you see hashtag, hashtag is really a device for you to help you see that which you want to see in, a, in an expedient way. When someone hashtags something, you will see it immediately because it's hashtag. Well, what I want just to say is this, that if you want to see real worship, real worship happens in real life. That's all I want to say. And to, to restate that in a different way, the best way for you to give your worship muscle, how many of you have muscles? Okay, let me just restate it this way. The best way for you to give your worship muscle a workout is in the gym we call life. Let me say that again. <laughs> the best way for you to give your worship muscle a workout it is in the gym we call life. Well, here is the story of Joseph. But before we go through that, let me ask you to pray for me and pray for yourself because we need God to help us understand the word, right? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask God that in the name of Jesus that the power of the Holy Spirit will just steer our thoughts and our hearts today. The control of our thoughts and our hearts help us to comprehend, understand, and be receptive to your word. Guide the preaching of your word, God that you alone may be honored, glorified, and magnified, God. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. So we start out this way. It's a narrative. Well, let's look at the story. Well, the story goes that you see here that Joseph had a problem. How many of you have problems? Oh, how many of you doesn't have any problem? Anyone? Anyone? Who do, you don't have a problem. Raise your hand. Well, if you don't have a problem, you, maybe you should try teaching yourself. Maybe you're not, you're not here. Because as long as you are here on earth, you will have problems. Well, we, we have here a, a young man who has a problem. Joseph had a problem. One Sunday afternoon, I was with my family. We were in a beach in Burnaby after the church. Our church in Vancouver as a morning service from 10.30 to 12.30, by the way, pray for us because next year we're praying that we will have two short services. We want to cut, cut short our service, one hour service, and then an hour service after that, and that's our goal next year. Well, this particular Sunday after church, we went to a beach because my family wanted to go uh, uh, paddle boating in Burnaby, in the Deer Lake area in Burnaby. So they did, but I didn't want to go. So my wife was with me and my, my second couple. By the way, I also have an apostolic mission. <laughs> my second couple was with me. So we sat on the bench. I said to my son and my daughter-in-law, go ahead and do your thing, enjoy. They said, okay, give us 90 minutes, Pops. Okay, no problem. We'll just sit here on the bench by the beach and we found a shade. Nice, beautiful tree gives, giving, giving us a nice big shade. So we sat there and we were putting a uh, sunblock because the, the sun was still hitting us at that time. When suddenly someone came by, uh, a 
a young man, maybe, no, not really young, but maybe about uh, 26 or maybe 30, uh, as good looking as uh, Chris there. Uh, you know, he, he came by, he came by this way. We were sitting in a bench that can seat three people. And there were three of us, myself, my wife, and my apo. And then this guy went by and said, can I sit with you? And, and in my mind, I was saying, okay, this bench can, can see three, three, you know, in my mind. But then again, I, I, I slid aside and said, yes, of course, sit down. And in my heart of hearts, I was saying, it's going to be okay. How many of you have, you know, how many of you felt that? You know, the, the Lord speaking to you, saying something to you that's so weird. Because normally your, 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 your intuition would say, this guy is up to something. Delicado, ikat sa Tagalog. Right? This is not nice. But then again, in my heart, I said, it's going to be okay. So I slid aside and he sat down with me. And then he had a fishing rod with him. How many of you go fishing? You go fishing, you like fishing, no one goes fishing, that's a trick. Okay, okay, this guy had a fishing rod and he had a fishing gear. He had his clothes, he had his weights, he had it with him. He sat beside me. So I then go and greeted him. He said, oh, so you're out fishing. You want to fish because he has a fishing rod. He said, no. Okay, this guy has a fishing rod, fishing rod, he's not quite right here, so what is that up to? Okay, I said, okay, um, what, are, what are the plans here today? He said, okay, he, here he goes, he said, well, I really don't know what I'm doing here. And then the moment he said that, I said, can I tell you something? He said, go ahead. I said, I think your life is drifting. And then he said, yeah, I'm drifting, all right. I don't know where my life is headed. Okay, so, we have, a, we have an opportunity here, I said to myself. I said, can I tell you something else? I said, you know how to get out of that drift? You need a goal. Yeah, I need a goal. I don't know what my goal is. Can I tell you something else? I told him, if you want to have a goal, you need to be grateful with your life. You need to be open to what God wants to do in your life. You need to act upon what God wants to do for you. And you need to have a legacy. Every word I said, tears started to flow in his eyes. And, and then I said, to cut the long story short, I said, can I tell you something else? I'd like to tell you what I heard this morning, I said. He said, go ahead. I heard someone preaching this morning, and I, 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 this someone said, you need Jesus for you to know your goal. And then the moment I said Jesus, he went, Row! Row! He started wailing and weeping. And then, because he couldn't, he couldn't control himself, he started covering his face with the, you know, the, that fishing, fishing uh, hat that he had. Because there were people passing by, and he was embarrassed because of his weeping and wailing. And I told him about Jesus. To cut the long story short, he gave his life to Jesus that day. And then I told him. Can I tell you something else? After he came, accepted Jesus, I told him, Can I tell you something else? Go ahead! <laughs> I told him, 
You know that guy I was telling you about that was preaching this morning? That was me. And he went, Rrr! And then he told me why. Because, because, the day before, he was talking to a pastor who was talking to him about Jesus Christ and he did not want to listen. He didn't want to have anything to do with this Jesus Christ. And there were Christians who were inviting him to go to church that day before. And then he said, I think God is telling me something. And then he told me about his problems. And of course, I will not elaborate. But this guy's name is Mark. Pray for him. He actually comes from Edmonton. And he goes to uh, 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 Alberta University? Uh, University, of, University of Alberta? Yeah. And he's a, a, a chemistry student taking a break in Burnaby because his parents live there, but he flew back here. And I, I texted him a couple of times asking him how he was doing. He said, thank you so much for, 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 for showing me Jesus Christ. Well, Mark had a problem. He had a big problem, like, like Joseph. So let's go through this story. Are you ready? Here's the story of Joseph. He had a problem. Well, problem number one. Problem number one, Joseph had a dream. If you look with me, verse 5, verse, verse five to verse 8, verse 5 to verse 8, we'll just go through, skip verse 3. We'll go back to verse 3 later on. Joseph had a dream. How many of you have your Bibles? Genesis 37, verse 5 to 8. His first problem is this. He had a dream. The dream goes, he told his brothers, now Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. Well, even more at this time, because prior to this verse, the father Jacob gave Joseph a robe prepared by the father Jacob for Joseph. And they hated Joseph for that. Now in verse 5, Joseph had a, had a dream and they hated him even more. Because the robe given to him was a sign that he was special. He was special. Now he had a dream at this time and he said to them, Hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves. I had bundle of wheat. And my bundle of wheat were standing and I saw that the bundle of wheat that you had bowed to the bundle of wheat that I had. Behold, we were by the sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheep arose and stood right, and behold, your sheaves gathered around and bowed down to my sheep. Immediately the brothers knew what this meant. They were saying, Are you indeed to reign over us, or are you indeed to rule over us? So that they hated him even more for his dreams, for his words. Now, his second problem was this. His second problem was this. The next problem he had was that he had, go back, he had another dream in verse 9 and 11. <laughs> Look at verse 9 and 11. Look at this. Then he had another dream. The dream goes and he told his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun and the moon and eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and told this to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him. But his father kept the saying in his mind. So his first, his first problem was that he had a dream. The second problem is that he had another dream. Well, the third problem that Joseph had is that he didn't know that he had 
like a problem. You know that's bad. If you have a problem and you don't know you have a problem, that's a problem. How many of you agree? That's not good. Well, look, look at verse, look at verse 12, 17, 18 to 22. Look at, look at this here. Uh, verse 12. Now his brothers, look at your word, your translation. Now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. And he said to him, Here I am. But <laughs> time, he didn't know that he was hated by his brothers already. And he said, Father, here I am. Here I am. <laughs> and let's, let, let's read some more. So he said to him, Go now, see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring me more. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron. So he came to Shechem, and a man found him wandering in the fields, and the man asked him, What are you seeing? I'm seeking for my brothers. He said, Tell me please where they are pasturing the flock. And the man said, They have gone far away, for I have heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. They saw him from afar, and before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. They hated him now. They wanted to kill him. You know, in Vancouver, there are many sightings of cougars. Have you, have you had any sightings of cougars here? No? No? <coughs> Grizzly bear? No? Not in Edmonton. Not in Edmonton, okay. In Vancouver, there are many sightings of cougars. If you just know the very spot, or the very area or municipal where you, where where news have been have been uh, uh, going around that there are cougars there. Well, what do you do? You stay away. You 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 don't want to be going near that place at all because cougars can devour you. That's a big problem. If you just know there's a problem there and they will devour you. You stay away. Well, this time Joseph didn't know that he is about to be devoured. His brother wants to devour him, to kill him. But you know the rest of the story. They wanted to kill him. Reuben said, let's not kill him. Okay. And then Judah said, well, why not, why not have a prophet? Let's sell him to the Ishmaelites. Yes. And then, of course, we know the rest of the story. But before we go there, in verse 23, I want you to see in verse 23, problem number four is this. Problem number four, Joseph had a robe of many colors. Look at verse 3. Before you look at 23, look at verse 3. In fact, in verse 3 of Genesis 37, it tells us, that it all began in that robe given to him by the Father. Now Israel loved Joseph, verse 3, if you have it in your Bible. Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his sons because he was the son of his own age. And because he loved Joseph, what did the Father do? He made him a robe. Made him a robe of what? Of many colors. Well, in those days, a robe with sleeves, you know, a robe with sleeves was distinctive, distinctive enough to merit mention here in the scripture because it's indicative of honor. For the father to give a robe of many colors to, to his son that's indicative of honor. Not only honor, it's indicative of wealth and possession. It was a mantle. Say mantle. mantle. It was a mantle that the father gave to the son. 
it's indicative of how special. Say special. special. So the father was saying, this son of mine is special. And you know, and you know, it's it's already obvious to us that that is exactly what it meant. Because the brothers hated him for that probe. Now look at verse 23 and 24 and just go through that uh, uh, verse if you can just scroll down or, or turn the page. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe. Verse 23. Remember, Reuben says, let's kill him. Judah says, no, let's, no, no, let's, let's make some money here. We can make some money here, okay? Let's sell him to the Ishmaelites. And then when they said that, they tore the robes from him. The robe of many colors, they tore it from him. And 24, number 24, and they took him and threw him into the pit. The pit was empty and there was no water in it. So, fast forward the story. You know the rest of the story. Anyone? Yeah. Anyone? Well, Joseph ended up to be a slave. A slave, yes. And then, but of course, fast forward the story, he ended up in, to be in the, in the house of Potiphar. Yeah. He, he is now, he is now uh, a servant in the house of Potiphar. And then as a servant there in the house of Potiphar, in her, this would be in chapter 39 there if you would scroll down immediately now. If you would scroll down, turn the page, we'll skip chapter 38. <clears throat> Chapter 38, we skip that. And then now let's look at verse chapter 39. Now Joseph had been brought down to Egypt and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, and brought him to, who had brought him from the Ishmaelites, who had brought him down there. Now, Joseph has another problem. You know what the problem is? is full of problem. This problem number five, problem number five, is probably his biggest problem. And this is it. Joseph was handsome. Look at verse five. Look at verse five. Joseph, now Joseph, no, verse seven, six and seven, six and seven. Now Joseph was handsome. You know, another translation for this, Brother Val, uh, this verse 6, or the, 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 the statement before 7, it says, Joseph was strikingly, strikingly handsome. In Tagalog, super guapo. Super guapo. And this was his, this was his fifth problem. You know, when we were younger, Brother Val and I, when we were younger, we had this problem. It was a problem. You know, I can still, I still remember Brother Val had a mustache here. Wow, just like Charles Bronson. Wow. Mustache. And had a, I, I had a long hair back then. Long hair as just just like just like Alice Cooper. Some of you have this problem. Andy, you have this problem. Yeah. Paul. <laughs> so here goes the story. Cut the long story short. The wife of Potiphar now has a bigger problem. <laughs> because Joseph was handsome. Now look at verse verse 7. And after time, his master's wife cast her, cast her eyes on Joseph and said to him, Lie. Another simple translation, the wife of Potiphar said, Sleep with me. But you know the rest of the story. Joseph said, I can't do that. I cannot. I can't do that. And to cut the long story short, we knew that Joseph did not do it, but the wife got angry and framed him. 
And because he was free, he ended up in prison. So that is problem number six. He was accused, in prison, and betrayed. But here is the turning point of the story. If you are here today and you are going through many problems, well, take comfort, my friend, because God never leaves you no for sins. In all of this, the turning point of this would be the very verse that follows this. But the Lord was with Joseph. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. The Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor. Gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison because the Lord was with him and whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. So, to cut the long story short now, Joseph, who had many problems, how many of you have many problems here today? You have many problems. You don't have a problem? Pinch yourself. Well, Joseph, who had many problems, now is the problem solver. He became the problem solver. The one who had many problems. Well, why did, how did that happen? Why so? Well, because the Lord was with him. The Lord God Almighty was with him. So, here goes the story. Follow me. <clears throat> okay. Joseph. Joseph interprets dreams. You know, there were dreams there. You know, dreams back then. You know, no one can figure out the, the, the meaning of dreams. It's not easy. There, were, there are magis in the East, you know. And, they, and, 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 and kings and princesses, they would call for magis. And, and, and astronomers to give interpretation of the dream, but this dream no one can interpret. No one can give interpretation of the dream. Well, Joseph did. He became the problem solver. First of all, for the chief, for the cup bearer's dream. Okay, the cup bearer's dream is in chapter 40, verse 1 to 5. I'll give you a summary. Now we don't have time to read all of them. <coughs> the the cup bearer's dream. Joseph was saying, this is the meaning of your dream. In three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to office. The cupbearer and the chief baker were in prison with Joseph. The cupbearer had a dream. He said, I saw grace with three ears. And after that, I saw a cup, I, I, I held my, in my hand a cup, I brought it to Pharaoh, I wonder what it means. Joseph said, the meaning of that dream is this, that in three days, you will be released, and you will, will be restored to the office of Pharaoh. Now, not only that, he, he, he gave interpretation to the, to the dream of the chief baker. The chief baker had a dream. In verse 16, maybe we can read a little bit of that uh, segment there. In three days, Joseph said, Pharaoh will lift up your head. But he will hang you. This is the dream of the chief baker. In three days, he will lift up your head in verse 19. <clears throat> but in three days, he will hang you. And then, of course, Joseph said to the cupbearer, Remember me, which the cupbearer forgot. He did not. So in chapter 41, now, if you would look at chapter 41, he gave interpretation to the dream of the Pharaoh. Now, the, you know, we're, we're getting close to the end of uh, uh, the highlight of the story here. Pharaoh had a dream. No one can give interpretation to the dream of the Pharaoh in chapter 41. The first dream. Pharaoh said, I had a dream. Seven attractive cows and then seven ugly cows. The seven ugly cows ate all the attractive cows. I wonder what it meant. 
Second dream. Pharaoh said, I had another dream. Seven years of good grain, and then seven years of thin, ugly grain. The ugly grain ate up all the good grain. Pharaoh called for the magicians in verse 48. No one can give interpretation. The cupbearer said, I remember there is a young man by the name of Joseph. He can give interpretation to your dream. So Pharaoh called for Joseph. And Joseph now gave advice to Pharaoh. What it meant, we remember the story, seven years of plenty will be followed by seven years of famine. By the way, this is, this is historically proven. This, this account right here is historically proven that there was such a time in, 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 in that land of Egypt and that time, that dispensation, that there was a famine that happened for that length of time. That can be proven. This is not, this is not a myth. It's, a, it, it, it's a history. It did happen. So anyway, now Pharaoh was pleased. We see in verse 56 and verse 57, moreover, all the earth came to Egypt to Joseph to buy grain. Pharaoh commissioned Joseph to take care of uh, organizing and planning for those seven years of plenty. Joseph said, let's save up so that when the seven years of famine come, we have something for ourselves. The whole world came to know that, that there is grain, there, there's grain, there's food in Egypt. While the rest of the world was in famine, Egypt had something. Why? Because Joseph had the wisdom from God to save up for that time. Now carry on. Joseph had many colors, but his many colors of robe were torn to pieces. I want to just show you how how the writer is using this device to tell us something. I want to show you three verses. Verse, chapter 44, we just read that. But tie this up to chapter 37. Go back to chapter 37. We were reading that a while ago. And look how this is being presented to us by the narrator. That there is something about that role. Torn to pieces that we need to understand. Surely he had been torn to pieces. This was this was the father Jacob saying, you know, I lost my son. And how did he know that he lost his son? Go back to 37. You will see that the, the brother the brothers were saying they sent the robe of many colors and brought it to the father and said, This we have found. The evidence that he was torn to pieces was the robe. This we have found. Please identify whether it is your son's robe or not. And he identified it and said, It is my son's. How does he know? Well, who made the robe? The father, his very hands, it was the very hands of the father that brought the robe together. So he knows. He said, it is my sons. A fierce animal has devoured him. Joseph is without doubt torn to pieces. In the mind of the father, his son, Joseph, is torn to pieces. I want you to to. to Fast forward this to another verse. This would be Genesis 45 and verse 1 to 3. And watch, watch the story here. I'm going to read it to you because something is blocking the, the screen there. Joseph made himself known to his brothers. You know the rest of the story. The brothers went to Egypt to buy grain. Joseph said, I want to see the I want to see the younger brother. I want to I want to know if you're saying that if you telling the truth. Go bring back your brother here. And then of course, they, 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 of course they were very afraid that, uh, you know, the father will not allow them to bring Benjamin to, to, to Egypt. 
and they were very afraid. But but to cut the long story short, now they were before Joseph. In verse 45, verse 1 to 3, Joseph made himself known to his brothers. He was in tears already. At this time, Joseph had no anger at all for his brothers, but only compassion. The, the brothers were now bowing to him, then, just as the dream said. The brothers said he was in tears, and right now he could not he could not keep his emotions together. And he was being torn, not by anger, but by just compassion and forgiveness for his brothers. And 45 would say, Joseph made himself known to his brothers, and he wept aloud, so loud, that the Egyptians heard it. And the household of Pharaoh heard it. Can you just imagine? And Joseph said to his brothers, I'm Joseph. I am Joseph. Just, just think about that, my friend. Joseph, who had many problems, became, he became the problem solver, not just for the family, but for the world. And he was not torn to pieces by anger, by rage. How many of you, how many of you feel that, that you know, you're being torn to pieces by, by something that someone did, someone, someone said something, someone did something to you, you're being torn, you're being torn. But Joseph was not torn to pieces. He says, I am Joseph. He could not be torn. He would not be torn to pieces because God was with him. The Lord God Almighty was with him. In fact, if you, if you fast forward to a very familiar passage of scripture, you would see this. This is how Joseph explained the whole thing. He said, you, you meant it for evil. Everything that happened, you meant it for evil, but God, my God, my God, meant it for good. God sent me before you to preserve life, and God sent me before you to preserve you, a remnant on earth, and to keep alive for you many survivors. And Joseph ended up bringing his family to Egypt. So in, in just putting this together, just stay with me, okay? We'll put this together. The narrative just tells me this. And it brings so much comfort when we think about it. That we have a father. How many of you believe that we have a father? <clears throat> this is what we see in the whole story. God's faithful hand weaves through every strand. And he seems through every layer and works through every tapestry, bringing special colors into your life. That is just another way of saying that the scriptures we already know. God has a plan for you, plans to prosper you. That is to give you hope and a future. Would you turn to someone and say, God has plans for you? You may not understand what, you may not understand the, the little things that is happening in your life, but, but I want to encourage you. God is working something out. Amen? The Father is preparing a beautiful robe for you. In fact, there are things, there are things we see here. Number one, how many of you, how many of you believe that we have Abba Father, amen? amen. Well, that is number one we should remember. If you are going through many problems or myriad of problems, this is number one that you are to remember. We have a faithful Father, amen? amen. Our God is faithful, amen? You're supposed to say amen. amen. sovereign God. He knows the beginning to end and end from the beginning. He knows all things. 
He has you in His hands. You have a faithful Father. Someone said that the five common problems among, among people is this. You are not satisfied with what you have. That's problem number one. The second problem is, is you believe that you do not have enough. The, the next problem, people would say that you, you, what you have, the concepts, concepts you have are outdated. You are not updated, but you are outdated. And the next problem, common problem to people would be this. You think you are not good enough. You, you, you see yourself as a planet, not as a star that has something to give. <laughs> Another problem common to man is this, you're bored. You're bored with your life. But whatever problems you are facing, I was hearing this here. Whatever you are going through today, remember you have a father. Your father is good. Your father is faithful. Your father is caring. He knows the little things happening in your life. I was driving uh, uh, the old uh, car that we had, and we spent thousands of dollars for that car. We were sharing a little bit of it. The brother while I was sharing, we we spent so much money on that car, and then we said, I was telling God, God, no more, God, you know, no more, and then. One day, after fixing the old car, I saw another uh, another notice or an indicator on the dashboard. It says, engine overheating. <laughs> I just spent 3000 4000 fixing the car and now it says, engine overheating. Stop immediately. And if you are a mechanic, you know, maybe you understand, I stopped immediately and then when I tried going forward, the, it was choking, there was nothing, there was no power, like... <laughs> <laughs> so, in fact, from, from when normal case, I have to drive from where I was to the house, it will take me 10 minutes. But it took me one hour and a half going home because I had to stop. And then go. I have to stop and go. But then again, I said, Father, give us this day our daily bread. <laughs> and forgive us. But I tell you that, to cut the long story short, the next day, that notice on the dashboard was gone. And I said, oh, maybe, oh, maybe I have to drive it. I have to drive it again. I called the mechanic. I said, it's gone. The mechanic said, drive it for, drive it for some more. I did. It's not there. And the mechanic said, drive it for an hour. I did. I drove it for an hour. It's not there. What's happening here? I said, okay. I'll try driving it to Suri. That will be an hour and 15 minutes. And back. Another hour. It's not there. What's happening here? I said, okay, the next day or two days after that, I said, okay, I'll go drive it to Kukwet Plum. That'll be an hour 30 minutes farther and then coming back another 30 minutes. It's gone. It's not there. What's happening? And I think the Father heard my prayer. God hears your prayers. What are you going through? What is it, my friend? What is it? You have a faithful father. The next thing I want to tell you is this, as we, as we wrap this up together, the next thing is this, you, I want to tell you that you have a mantle. Turn to someone and say, you have a mantle. And your mantle says you are special. Turn to someone and say, you are special. Uh, do it again. Look that person straight in the eye and say, you are special. The world can try to rip your robe apart and tear you to pieces, but I'm telling you, you have a mantle and God's hand is upon you. You may think that you are a planet, 
and not a star. But I'm telling you, you are special and you have a calling from God. You have a purpose in this life. You have a destiny in this life. God has a plan for you. You are clothed with the righteousness of Christ. If you have given your life to Jesus Christ, that is what He clothes you with. He clothes you with His robe of righteousness. Not because of what you've done, but because of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross for you. The third thing I want you to remember is this, that this robe was prepared by the Father for you. You are so special, He gave His Son, His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. His fingers sewed them together. His hand is on every seemingly insignificant tapestry of life. He, his imprint is, is in every intertwining woven strand of circumstance in your life. Whatever is happening in your life, God's hand is right there. Because you are His child. You have a mantle. You are special. The Father prepared it for you. He weaves through every strand, seems through every layer, works through every tapestry of life to bring out colors, many colors in your life. You are so special that Jesus went to the cross. Prior to the cross, He went to a place called Gethsemane. He went to Gethsemane, a place of suffering, so that when you face your Gethsemane, you will not feel so much alone. Because we all have our Gethsemane. Those times of many sufferings and problems. Mighty waters. But Jesus says, Lord, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I leave you with this. Just a simple reminder, my friend. And then we shall pray. A 19th century German poet says, For you to be great in life, you need to live from a deep place. But I'd like to take that and say, For you to be great, you need to live from the secret place where you can commune with your heavenly Father. Where you can talk to Him and pour out all the issues that you have in your heart. And you bring it to Him. You cry to Him. You weep to Him. You complain to Him. You tell Him anything. He's not Father, He's God. He listens. So live from that secret place, my friend. Whatever you are going to really, what, whatever it is, what, whatever problem, you, young, young girls, young boys, oh, you have your issues. We you know, husbands and wives, you have yours. But whatever you're going through, you, you bring it to God. You live from there. You live from there. Again, again, I say you live from there because that is where you live. But you don't stay there. You have to face the life that you have. But you live from that because you know the Father that meets you there is always with you wherever you go. You live from that secret place. I leave you with this story and then we will pray, all right? Just recently, we we had a new member in the church, a young, young Christian, a young lady. She had a baby, and she was pregnant, and she asked us to pray for her, which we did. We prayed for her. And then we got the news from the aunt who was in the hospital. Sister Tina, if you remember, Tina Kanabe. The aunt called us and said, Pastor, please pray for the baby. The baby's name is Baby Raina. The infant baby has a heart that is not 100% functioning. 
the heart is in trouble. The doctor says, the heart, the, the heart's in trouble, the kidneys are in trouble. The kidneys are not functioning well. And the liver, I mean the liver, is not functioning well. That week, when, 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 when she gave birth, that week, the doctors gave their recommendation. The doctor says, our, our highest recommendation is that we just, we just let her go. And, and just give her peace. In fact, they recommended that they place the baby, infant, in the hospice. And I think if you know what that means, it means it's, it's not good. It's, it's, going to, it's going to be palliative care. Just, just caring for the baby, giving her peace and comfort, and then letting her go. But like you do. Like you do. When you are in that spot, what do you do? Well, you go to the sea. You tell your Abba Father, Abba, please, please have mercy. Give us this baby. Give us this baby back. There was no chance. There was no chance. Doctor said, we have to let her go. With pleadings from the aunt and the, the mother, in prayers, the doctors agreed to put her in life support. The second week she was in life support, we visited her. And then <clears throat> the mother said, one day they were, they were surprised to see the doctors removing the oxygen from the baby, from the infant. The doctors were saying, let her go, take it away. And the doctors did just that. And the mother said, no, 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 what are you doing? Why are you taking her out from, from life support and the oxygen she needs? The doctor, the doctor said, doctor, the doctor turned to the mother and said, well, she doesn't need it. We see that she's breathing on her own. Secondly, she was breathing on her own. And then on, we kept praying, praying again, praying again. On the third week, we, we went to the hospital and dedicated the baby. Because the mother said, I want, I want us to dedicate this baby now to God. We want to dedicate her to God. We did, we prayed for her. And then, that day, the doctor said, same doctor, same surgeon, who said, we got to let her go. She's, we, there's nothing we can do for her. Same doctor said, your baby does not belong here in this hospital. You need to go home. There's nothing wrong with your baby. Praise the Lord. And last Sunday, I was surprised to see Carol, the mother, and the baby Raymond in the church. And we prayed for them and dedicated them to them. Whatever you're going through, my friend, talk to your father. So let's just do that right now. And, and while you're seated right there, it's just very simple. I want you to. If you have a person in front of you, uh, put your put your right right hand on the shoulders of the person in front of you. If you have no one in front of you, turn to someone beside you and pray for that someone. Thank you. 
give the opportunity for us to pray. Let's pray, pray, pray a blessing for the song. Continue praying just as well. If you are here for the first time, you have never given your life to Jesus. I want to pray with you. Maybe you heard this message before, but you never made a decision. Pray this prayer with me, Father. I open the door of my heart to you. Forgive me for for how I have lived this life. Forgive me for my sins. I repent. I turn away from my old life. Now I turn to you. I thank you that you have called me. You are the one who calls me. So now I'm responding to your call. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. This day on I will live for you. By grace, I am your child. I am saved. I have eternal life. And I am born again now because of what 